Today I'm going to introduce the lecture entitled Physical Basis of Introscopy and Subject is in Medical Biophysics. So, uh, I want to highlight some ideas, some key points about the subject itself and clarify something before we proceed. Well, as you can see, biophysics is a combined science, and the title itself consists of two parts and mentioned biology and physics. I hope everyone knows that biology is a science about the life systems, life forms, life creatures, life objects, something that life. In contrast, physics typically refers to the inorganic systems, inorganic objects, not life things. Well, how to put them together? The explanation is quite easy. We talk about the biophysics when we investigate how life forms, how life creatures live and survive and evolve and develop under the total government of the physics. Because physics adds the rules of the nature, adds the rules of the whole universe. And nowhere in that universe you are or anything are free from the rules of the physics. So, biophysics is a science that combines two sciences together. But medical biophysics, it could be considered as a sub-branch of that science or particular applied science. Here we introduce one more title of the scientific term it's a medicine. And medical science, as you know, is dedicated to the treatment of the diseases among the human beings. Well, when we talk about the medical biophysics, we talk about how physical factors, how rules of the physics could affect behavior or state or appearance of the life forms, including human beings, and how this information could be used in a medical field. So here we go. I'm going to claim that this story is totally fit to that idea of the combined sciences, medical, biology, and physics. And this story is dedicated to the technologies which totally claimed as an introscopy and how they govern it by the physics, definitely. Here we go. Medical field or medical science itself, it's a really large area of knowledge which is dedicated to the three major branches. As you can see, it's a diagnostics. Well, what do we mean by this term? It's a recognition of disease, identification of disease by some information that we acquire from the patient. And yeah, totally, uh, I need to highlight difference between the medical science, medicine itself, and the, let's say, veterinary. That's a story about animals, but here we talk about the human beings, not of all life species, not of all life forms, but we talk about particular human beings and how to detect disease in a human's body. So that's a branch claimed as a diagnosis. <clears throat> Among the different options, we should identify the proper name of that disease. And once we complete this stage, it definitely should be the first one. We can go toward the second one, and second part is definitely treatment. Once we recognize our enemy, we can fight it properly. And treatment have a very similar synonymous terms like uh, therapy or curation. But overall idea of that branch is to do something with an identified on the first stage disease. To eradicate, to eliminate it, if it's possible indeed. But if it's not possible, well, we try to correct the story, adjust the present condition of the human body to relieve the suffer of the patient. And that's our major goal here. Well, there is a one more branch, and it's, uh, I hope everybody knows about it. It's a preventive medicine. 
and they stay a little bit differ from the different uh, other things. It's uh, well, rather than fight with the existing and emerging disease, we probably can stop it before it arises. Most obvious appearance of the preventive medicine is uh, fighting with the spreading of infection and uh, let's say flu or any sort of it. If we put some special measures in a proper manner, we really can stop the spreading of the infection among the population and really we can cancel epidemic. It's possible. But as you guess, prevention, it's not a primary, I, I mean, it couldn't appear as a first thing. First of all, we should identify some diseases in some real cases. And we need to know, let's say, how this infection is treated, which particular way is used, let's say, through the air, or through the water, or through the soil. And only after that, we can choose the proper preventive measures. So, but uh, this story, this lecture is dedicated to the diagnostic branch and it's highlighted on a slide, as you can see. Diagnostics, it's our first point for sure. Recognition of disease. But how are we going to do this? Well, we should acquire some information about a particular case and compare with a, some typical appearance of disease. After that, if we find the match, we, we can say that, look, we identified the problem here. The information that we gather from the patient, it's claimed as a symptoms and signs of that disease. And in that particular case, it could appear or not. So that's why diagnostics, it's always full of doubts. And uh, it's typically goes in terms of probability. There are nearly no cases with a 100% uh, guaranteed results. But look, we have some problem here. How we acquired this information? When I said we, I suppose that we doctors, the persons who deal with a patient Patient, it's another human being who suffered from some disease, who have some problem, some disorder, and the patient comes to the doctor attempting to solve the issues. Well, we can see something ourselves, and it's a objective things. It's a sign of disease. We can observe, we can prove its existence without even a contact with the patient. In a simple terms, it's a sign of disease, it's a something that exists without opinion, without control of the patient. And it couldn't be affected by his or her individual perception or opinion or mood or whatever. Well, it's really existing thing and we can detect it. Well, as example, we, we can set some sort of rush, let's say this. But in contrast, symptoms, it's a subjective thing. Person who suffer should tell you that, look, I have this problem, I feel that thing, I, I don't know, last night I experienced this thing. So, symptoms, it's a something the patient tell you. And you always should be aware of this. It could be affected by the personal perception of that person. Now we can actually, you can settle the pose here for that story and try to recall some symptoms and some signs of disease that you know. But we go forward and yeah, you can arrange it in a, some sort of list to verify, do you have ideas which symptoms you know, which signs you know. I realize that you are not very familiar with the medical field because you are students of the first course, but anyway, try to use your own experience with the some diseases that you had in the past time. Now I want to highlight one side of that story. Signs of disease, they supposed to be visible for the doctor, for the healthcare professionals, but visible, what does it mean? 
that we can see our vision I mean, human beings we are limited we cannot look inside the human body and that's a great problem of our visual perception uh, vision in turn bring for us let's say 99% of the incoming information about surrounding the world so now we can claim that in a medicine we have branch diagnostics and inside these diagnostics we have a sub-branch medical imaging and this term put together all options how we can visualize some story some case of disease which happens with that particular patient or oh, patients totally sad how we can visualize disease and that's a primary goal of the medical imaging and this term is very wide it put together all options how to make disease visible but there not all of them are equally suitable and equally reliable and equally let's say comfortable for the human perception we have some sub branches even in the medical imaging field and here we are we have two great branches in a field of medical imaging and they could be claimed it as an interscopy and the endoscopy so the sense of the both terms is quite similar they just rely on two different words let's say intro it's a latin word mean inside and endo it's a greek word which also means the same it's still inside what does mean scopy scopy mean observation viewing and the major idea of both branches are look inside the patient but we're going to do it in a different way in a case of endoscopy we rely on our visual perception on a visible light and we use some devices that called endoscopes as you guess to sneak into the human body typically through the natural cavities and entrances and investigate hollow parts of the human body like oracle cavity abdominal cavity and it's a little bit special cases in the nowadays endoscopy is often is typically supported by the surgery that's why we can make incision and sneak by the endoscope inside but more traditional more convenient way to investigate internal hollow parts like a digestive tract that's a rectum anoscopy for example we can go to the digestive tract from the back side or we can go through the oral cavity toward the esophagus toward the stomach even to the duodenum so these options are actually the same we can see by our eyes what happens inside the patient's body we just use some device endoscope to bring this information from inner side to the outer side of the patient Interscopy, that branch is actually differ we use other options rather than visible light but we turn it finally to the visible image because it should be perceivable for the doctor because doctor is uh, as you guess human being so interscopy rely on a different source of electromagnetic waves like x-rays gamma rays and some other options and that's a major thing in that story how we can use different various physical phenomena physical processes in our technologies which allow for us finally to look what happens inside the human body even in those regions which are not typically observable and uh, actually definitely not visible from the outer side so interscopy as you see it's a little bit wider and rely on a various physical processes well the first technology that should be mentioned here it's a projection of radiography it should be claimed like the oldest one but now i want to put some highlight on the structure of that story when we're going to describe some technology some method some procedure doesn't matter which term you will use here we talk about the intentionally performed activity and once human being do something that person should have a goal 
And that's the third thing that we should have highlight here and in all of our stories here. So what's a goal? How does it work? It's a second chapter principle of operation, as you can see. Third chapter, we should highlight what we cannot do. It's a limitations, as you see, and restrictions. Uh, restriction means slightly differ. It means what is not allowed to do due to some hazardous consequences or other reasons. And in the same field of interscopy, we have various technologies. And that's why we always could highlight advantages, disadvantages. It's a comparison. One technology could be better for that particular patient, and it's mean it's advantage, but it have some reason we should highlight. And this part in that story will go toward you. As you can see on that slide, advantages, disadvantages, it's up to you. You should be able to perform comparison between the technologies, various technologies available in that field, and you should realize why one option is better than another in a particular case. So, but anyway, advantages, disadvantages could be claimed as a quite simple terms, like a cost, time consuming, well, simplicity of setup, availability for the wide, actually, healthcare system, and some other things. But they also could be quite specific. Let's turn to the particular technology, number one in that list, historically first one, it's a projection radiography. So what's the goal of this story? Again, goal is the same for all intrascopic technologies. We want to obtain some image of internal regions of the body, internal organs. But here we have a actually problem. Visible light again cannot pass through. And that's why we use X-rays. X-rays, it's still electromagnetic waves, but they have different frequency. That's why they're not so easily absorbed by tissues in a human body, especially said by the soft tissues. And here it is, it's highlighted in the principle of operation. So, so-called soft tissues like a muscular tissue, connective tissue, skin, uh, glandular tissue, etc. They have insufficient calcium atoms and the other observers of the X-rays. In contrast, heart tissue, and we have a great example of the bone, definitely. They are saturated in a very high degree by the calcium atoms, and they could be claimed as an absorber of the X-rays. That's why soft tissues are nearly invisible, and in contrast, bones, teeth, they are visible, even a cartilage bit. So that's a major idea of the operation. We send the X-ray through the human body and some tissues become visible and they appear, some tissues not. Definitely X-ray itself is not visible. That's why we project it on a, some film whereby chemical way we make it visible like in traditional photographic technologies. So limitations, yes, definitely this technology have a limitation. We get only two-dimensional image only plain appearance. And the low contrast of the soft tissue, it's a something that we cannot overcome. Soft tissues, like a brain, like blood vessels, heart, lungs, kidneys, they are barely visible. They appear like, let's say, some sort of the shadow and not clearly visible. But for the bones, as you guess, this technology is probably the best one. And now you have some ideas about, I guess, advantages, disadvantages. Please realize that limitations makes impossible to achieve the goal. But disadvantages, it's likely if it's been possible, but it's really reduce the quality or make it harder, more complicated, more expensive, time consuming, etc. Well, here it is. That's the way how it looks like X-ray shot in a most traditional and most basic way. Soft tissues gives to us some sort of a cloud or shadow and we barely get no information about its details even some injuries probably there but bones are clearly visible and if some damage comes to the bones we will undoubtedly see it now you can see that two shots are were done that happens because of the planar nature two-dimensional nature of that technology from the single direction 
we cannot evaluate properly three-dimensional object, and that's a sense of the limitation. So the science didn't stop on this first invention. It comes, this technology originally comes, let's say, in the end of the 19th century and a little bit evolved in the beginning of the 20th century. But science didn't stop on that point. It's go forward and some enhancement comes. So here it is. Let's say fluoroscopy or fluorography. It's an enhanced version of the previous technology. So now I want to comment the terms in a uh, difference in the terms. That's uh, fluoroscopy, it means observation in the real time even. If we talk about the fluorography, it means we have a static shot on a photographic film or something like this. Well, go, it's the same. We go inside the human body. We try to see what happened there and we can get, let's say, some sort of the movie real time and how lungs expanding, how heart beating, how bones move, and etc. We can get all the things. And that's our goal of that particular technology, fluoroscopy. As you guess, it was a serious advancement. So principle of operation, it's nearly the same. From one side of the body, we send a beam of X-ray and it passes through the human body, partially absorbed by bones, little bit absorbed by the soft tissues. Yeah, we also can settle enhancement radio contrast agents. It's a artificial substances that introduce it into the human body. It could be solid or it could be fluid. We can even make an injection to make a shot of blood vessels or even a heart chambers themselves. So this substance is visible and it's allowed for us to see what happens around it. But soft tissues are still invisible. Well, limitations, it's the same, only two-dimensional image. But now we're partially solved by the contrast agents, option of the low contrast of the soft tissues. And yet this technology, due to some technical enhancement, can bring for us much brighter light, much brighter image, rather than previous one. So that's the way how it looks like. Even you can see the animation Again, I want to remind you, this technology provides a great feature. We can observe in real time how something happens inside the human body. In that short movie, this patient swallow radio contrast agent. I guess it's a barium sulfide, more typically. And you can see how it goes through the mouth cavity, to the esophagus, and travel downward. So you really can move and trace all actions there. If there are some penetration, some holes, some I don't know, abnormalities in the muscles, you will see it on your screen. So it's a great option to see function of the human body or particular organs. So that's an old image that illustrate great feature. We use fluorescent screen and we really can walk around our patient and see in the real time really what happens right now. But look, this option this one bring the as you guess some damage by the hazardous x-rays beams as for the patient as for the doctor in that case doctor even had a serious impact by the x-rays well doctor will be exposure through the day by day regular way actually for the great number of deaths investigations and it's been Hazardous beams will totally destroy uh, cells there. But for the single patient, yeah, it's not a problem. So when we want to observe in real time, it means our patient will have not a bright shot like in the first case, but through the quite long exposure for the hazardous X-rays. Doctors in turn will suffer even more. Well, in nowadays, digital technologies solve this issue and doctors are safe. Next step and next generation, it was an attempt to solve another issue of the previous technologies. It's planar for the two-dimensional nature. And the idea is let's take a look from the different directions on the same object and make a multiple shots or uh, multiple images overlaying each other. So here it is. It's our goal. 
we still produce a two-dimensional images on the same film, on the same photographic film, but we will do it from the several directions. <clears throat> Basically, the key physical process is remain the same. It's an absorption, absorption of X-rays. And again, wounds absorb it better, soft tissues will be not so good, but anyway, we have serious after shots from the different directions. And we cannot solve another problem of the low contrast of the soft tissues, but now we get a little bit more information about three-dimensional nature of the real object. So that's the way how it looks like. It's, as you guess, focal plane tomography shot on the lower part of the skull. And here are the girls, here are the keys, and all of them shown in the same show. In a, in a previous technology, as you guess, it, it wasn't possible. In reality, on that image, we have several of them, several of shots, put it together from the different directions. And real three-dimensional object skull look like a flat image. But again, these options didn't solve all the issues and didn't eliminate the problem of the hazardous nature of X-rays. But anyway, science go forward and digital, digital technologies rises and we get computed tomography. It's a definitely good and nearly best option for the all X-rays. Now we try to resolve both issues, both, restrict, both limitations of the previous technologies. We want to get two-dimensional image and we want to visualize properly soft tissues. So here it is. We do it with a special computer-based technology. We send the X-rays from all around the human body or particular region of it. And on the opposite side, we not gather it by the photographic film or something like this or even a fluorescent screen with a human eye. No, we use special sensor that's been around the human body. And we, after that, this raw data will be processed by the special computer-based algorithm and reconstructed image will be obtained. Please realize it's a great feature of that technology, nothing like before. There we got well, sophisticated images, but they are natural, how it looks like, and this appears in the same way on the show. Here, by the spinning of the X-ray source and the sensor, we get just the raw data, just the numbers. And they will be digitalized, they will be processed in a special manner, and in a virtuality, in a computer virtual world, we will get a reconstructed image of the human body or some part of it. Well, these technology have no obvious limitations or restrictions, but about advantages and disadvantages, you should provide some ideas yourself. Do not forget about it. And here it is how it looks like. On a computer screen, you can see the cross section of the part, which is, well, it's referred to the abdominal region. With uh, torpor region, we can see the lungs cross section. They are barely invisible, but we can see the ribs, we can see the columnar vertebralis, and even some blood vessels there. So, as you see, it's, it's a great technology. It provides great clarity of images, and uh, it's resolved both problems of the previous technologies. Now, image will really show you three-dimensional nature of the human body, and you even can measure it. And another feature of that technology that you can see in the blood vessels. It depends typically from the contrast agent, yeah, and this image is definitely enhanced by the contrast agent. Anyway, it's much better than before. I mean in, quality, in terms of quality of that image. Well, as you guess, we should pay for this and this technology have some disadvantages. Try to find them yourself. Next step is totally out of the field of X-rays, which were hazardous, as you know. And we go toward the another side of the electromagnetic wave spectrum, which goes to the radio waves. 
and radio waves, they really provide for us great option. It's called magnetic resonance imaging. And this technology is based on a nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon. What does it mean? That atom which have, have particular set of the protons and neutrons down will capture incoming radio waves with a particular frequency which is totally specific to that particular atom. And it means if hydrogen can capture some particular frequency, other atom like nitrogen or phosphorus or whatever will capture different things. And that's why we are now capable to make a virtual map of the different elements and how they are aligned in a human body. In uh, all technologies which rely on uh, X-rays, as you guessed, we deal with the calcium because it was a nearly single natural absorber for the X-rays. Here we can retune our device, MRI scanner, for the different atom, and we can investigate where is this atom located. Typically, our aim is a uh, hydrogen. Because hydrogens are actually, these atoms are everywhere. In the soft tissues, in the bones, in the cartilage, it doesn't matter. In the blood, you can meet them everywhere. So, but different tissues will appear in a different, let's say, brightness on a great scale. Some tissues have more hydrogen, some tissues have less. And that's a way how we can visualize. But here I need to make a special highlight. This technology, like a previous one, rely on the idea of indirect imaging. We not obtain the image directly. We scan around some part of the body, and after this, image will be reconstructed from the raw data obtained by the sensor. Well, this technology has one very special limitation. Nuclear magnetic resonance phenomena could appear only under the strong applied magnetic field. And it means if inside the human body or even outside we will have some metallic objects which have magnetic properties, or this patient will have some problems. Especially we talk about the artificial pacemakers or another electronic or at least magnetic enhancers for the human body, which are invented now by nowadays science. But even some metallic components in the bones, which are quite primitive, anyway, they can bring some problem. And in applied magnetic field, they will try to move and overheat. That can bring the pain for our patient. That's why such persons should totally avoid this technology. That's a limitation. No, it's a restriction. You can perform this test for that patient, but it will bring suffer, even injury, even a cause of death. That's why it's technically said possible, but it's really a bad idea to do this. We'll go forward to another option. Yeah, here it is. That's a way how MRIs can look like. And yeah, now we're ready to go toward the brain. Brain images are really great, clear and detailed. And we, we can see all things what happened there, but in the terms of structure. This technology has some problem as most of the previous. It brings for structural information, not the functional. Well, when you make this scan of the brain, you cannot see how it's operate how information is processed there, and even barely how metabolic processes goes there. So MRI technology in a, in a basic form not able to demonstrate for you activity of some particular organ, despite its structural images are really clear, and even more, it can reconstruct for a three-dimensional shape of the object, and you can spin it in a virtual reality and look from the different angles and get whatever information you want about the structure. So next stage of evolution of that technology is it's a positron emission tomography. And this technology is very similar to the previous two tomographic basic technologies because approach is the same. Let's scan around the human body or particular region of the human body. But physical core is totally different. 
In the previous cases, we use external source of some electromagnetic waves, and we send them through the human body or particular part of it. But now not. We use different physical source. We use process of annihilation. We introduce artificial unstable elements, which are capable to emit the positrons, that's the antiparticles. When they emit inside the human body, its counterpart, it's, uh, it's an electron, they will annihilate. It means these particles will disappear, but instead they will create quantum of energy. And this quantum of energy typically feeds to the range of the gamma rays even. Now we don't talk about the hazardous X-rays, now we talk about the hazardous gamma rays. But number of such appearances is quite low. So what happens to you? We introduce this tracing agent and it will be spread through the tissues. Typically it's combined with a glucose molecule. So and according to the metabolic rate, consumption rate, different tissues will appear as a different emitters of that gamma rays. So that, that's a combined idea of the physics and biology, how it's allowed for us to visualize. We just move the scan around the human body, again get the raw data and reconstruct you know, by the special computer software, we can reconstruct the scan or even the whole three-dimensional model which represents human body as a set of spots with a different intensity of emission. This technology has some limitation. And this tracer, this artificial molecule which we did introduce there, should distribute properly in a tissue or region or organ of interest. Well, if we talk about the glucose, we can guess that some tissues will consume it more, much more. It's like muscles, like a brain, like a, I don't know, heart, like a kidney, like a liver even. But what about bones? Bones, they don't need so much glucose. <laughs> even even if, if you're running, if you're jumping, no. They have a very low consumption rate. And that's why bones, cartilagos, connective tissue will be quite poorly visible in a such scans. So, as you see, some of the soft tissues better visualize it here, even less probably, but some tissues not so good, and the bones are barely visible. Well, here is an example of the such scan of the brain. As you see, it's quite similar to the previous one, but here, intensity of the color and the color itself code the intensity of that gamma beam that comes from the human body. So, brighter regions emit more, but what does it mean? Then these regions of the brain or especially set cortex, I guess here, will consume more of these tracer molecules. But in the central regions, when we have ventricles in the brain, there are typically not so high metabolic rate, not so great number of the active cells, but that's why they look like a blue regions. So this technology allows for us to visualize functional activity of the some organ. In that case, it's a brain. We, we can do it for the liver, we can do it for the kidney, we can do it for the muscles also. Actually, we can test anything, but tissues that are consumers, that have metabolic process related with their major function, will be depicted and visualized properly. As you can see here, bone tissue, which formed the skull that covered the brain, it's still alive, it's still functional, but barely not visible here. And now we go to the last, but not the least, technology. It's a medical ultrasonography. In this case, we totally stay out of electromagnetic waves and we talk about the sound waves. It's a mechanical oscillations and we can claim that ultrasonic beam or ultrasound it's something that we human beings cannot hear because its frequency is higher than our perception range. So that's why we claim it ultrasound. It's above the sound by its frequency. 
So such ultrasonic beam could be created even by some live creatures, as you know, bats, dolphins, etc. But we human beings rely on a higher frequencies, typically, let's say, 1 megahertz up to 5 megahertz, and created definitely by our electronic devices. So what's the goal of this technology? That's a family of technologies, actually. The goal is remain the same. We want to visualize something that happens inside the human body, structure, and if it's possible, function also. So we send the beam from outer surface, ultrasonic beam, and we got several options. And this ultrasonic beam could be absorbed by the tissue, could be reflected, definitely it will be reflected and scattered, but we don't care about these options. But we rely on a major process, reflection. So it's like an echo in a room, in a cave, even in a forest, you can find it. So echo, it's a returning back of the emitted previously acoustic oscillation. And now we can measure the time, how far it's traveled. So uh, this reflecting line, this reflecting surface will give for us different time. If it stay closer, echo beam will turn back faster. If it stay far, it means that reflected beam will come later. So this difference could be detected and captured by the electronic systems, definitely it's computer-based technology, and reconstructed in terms of image. We measure the distance for the different layers in a human body. And on a computer screen we will get reconstructed layers. But definitely computer systems have no idea what do we see there. And that's why these technologies definitely rely on a skill and perception of the operator. Well, it could be not a strong side of this technology. Think about it. Well, limitation. We have some physical and biological issues here. Well, some actually tissues less dense rather than previous. And that's why they not reflect ultrasonic beam. That happens, for example, if we send the ultrasonic beam toward the torical region, when it's passed through the skin, through the muscles, through the ribs even, uh, these tissues have no problem and they could be visualized. But when it comes to the lungs, which I feel it with the air, air, as you guess, have lower density and lower acoustic density. That's why it send no beam back, no reflection from the lungs, from that gases area inside the thorax. And that's why lungs remain the, let's say, blank spot and undetectable properly for this technology. Well, there is another limitation. For example, it's a skull itself. It's a, it's a protective layer around the brain, as you know, composite from the bones. And the density not allowed to investigate less dense brain behind the skull. And that's a problem. So, that's the way how ultrasonic image look like. As you see, it's a, some landscape of gray scale images, some white spots. It's just mean different density for the ultrasonic beam. And that's why this technology gives us something totally different from our natural perception. And take a look on this image and try to realize that just some of these spots are intentionally colored and that's why you can recognize that that's an outer, that's a vena inferior, vena cava inferior, etc. Without proper training, recognition of something on such images, it's quite complicated. In the previous technologies, you really can see how it looks like in a real scale. Here, not exactly. Now, this question is up to you. Try to express it in some sort of you are actually thinking. Uh, you also can put it in your copybook. So, what's the best option from all this versatility, at your opinion? And that's the end of the story. Thank you for your attention.